so thanks for coming. Thank you. Um, it's great to be here. Uh, looking forward to the um, workshop of a topic I dearly love. Um, <clears throat> okay, I should uh, put on a point away. Is this um, no? Huh? Okay, I, I have I have my own. talking about physiology. Uh, so what is physiology? Uh, physiology is about, uh, about the whole, right? The whole could be uh, a cell, could be an organism, or could be a community, it's all a whole. But in, in the context of this workshop, or the division is that I think the physiology referred to the cell, right? And then, then we have the larger scale, uh, that's a community. Uh, first, let me tell you what I will not talk about you know, what, what, uh, some of the uh, negative message I, I, I hope to convey. Once, I, don't, I do not know how many molecular uh, system biologists are out there, right? Uh, but the cell is not a, just a collection of uh, molecules that interact with each other. Quite often, if we talk to molecular biologists, that's the way they view the cell. Yes, certainly molecules are important, interactions are important, but it's not just that. Right? There's more uh, to the whole. Uh, to the ecology modelers, right? Uh, we would like to write down a whole bunch of uh, monokinetics and the, 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 the metabolism, excretion, and uptake, and so forth, and talk to each other. Uh, well, yes, that may be a part of it, uh, it, but it's probably more than that, right? You shouldn't see the cell just uh, running a bunch of uh, uh, mono equations, right? And uh, <clears throat> yeah, and the environment. Uh, typically, it's uh, more than just a chemostat. I mean, even if you try to make it a chemostat, uh, often it's more than a chemostat. Right? Um, and then to uh, those that model things from more the evolutionary perspective, uh, we often, yes, we would all like to find optimization principles uh, uh, that may exist, but then uh, it's often not clear what these guys hold fix and what these guys optimize them, even if they're doing optimization, right? So uh, I think it'll be, it's a very interesting uh, uh, topic to think about to explore. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so, yes, so we're talking about physiology, and the physiology as I say, is the, uh, at the nexus of the linking um, uh, molecules and the communities, right? So what's the output of the physiological studies? Well, it's about the behavior of the cell. So the output is about behaviors, right? So it could be how fast they grow, uh, how much stuff are made, you know, uh, viability, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? So it's beyond uh, mo molecular properties. Uh, and what's the input? What well, input is the environment, right? Could be, 
what nutrients are there, temperature, pH, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So what we seek uh, in the physiological study right, is a direct link from environment, uh, environmental input to the output uh, of the cell. The uh, difficulty is, of course, that uh, cells are made of molecules, and these things really affect the molecules. Right, so that's really what it is. And we need to somehow you know, cross grain over the molecules to get to a link uh, to physiology. Right. And uh, the best examples that we can point to where this is done successfully is uh, Monogross law. This Monogross law takes as input concentration of nutrient and output is a physi physiological property. I I'll talk a little bit more about monogross, but it's a highly non-trivial. That, that anything coherent will come out. Uh, you know, treating the cell like a chemical reaction, that's amazing to think about. Okay, um, <coughs> okay. Uh, right? But then I should remind you that not, not everything you ask you look at uh, will be simple. Okay, we, there's only simple things to report if the cell decided to do something to make it simple. Otherwise, you know, you're, you're writing down a collection of equations and it does whatever it does, okay? So now, I come from statistical mechanics, many of you come from statistical mechanics, right? And uh, in statistical mechanics, we say, well, we don't care what the cell or whatever the system is doing, we just apply the power of statistics and we get something, okay? But uh, I'm not sure how successful that approach would be, okay? Because uh, yes, you can get this for some average behavior, right, but often, a living system uh, already uh, in a very special corner of the parameter space, let's say, right? And uh, what, uh, well, at least my interesting, uh, one of my interests in looking at living system is to see what these uh, uh, special parameter space, uh, where, where interesting behavior can arise out of this uh, special parameter space. Um, <clears throat> okay, so, Right, so the so so mono gross law is about nutrients, right? Can we say similar things about temperature, pH, and other variables? Do we have to struggle through uh, molecules every time? Right. <clears throat> what about beyond exponential growth? And we we'll see I mean, a lot of times in the community, uh, what right do we have to ask uh, to hold uh, these systems in exponential growth? Okay, and. Uh, huh? Right, and uh, the, the other thing is a similarity difference across organisms. Yes, Monod studied E. coli, and uh, he found roughly where, where, you vary, where he varied the nutrient concentration, there's a simple relation, right? Even that is, is that applicable to other systems. But what, what is underlying it that allows it to be applicable, okay? And of course, uh, much for the properties that we'll be talking about today <laughs> and beyond, uh, what right do we have to expect uh, for them to go beyond model organisms that's carefully uh, studied, right? And sometimes we'll see surprising universality, right? Sometimes what we expect to be uh, simple is not simple, right? It's just uh, we have very limited understanding of uh, living systems, and uh, our intuition is not a good guy. <clears throat> okay, so uh, I was asked to uh, give a number of uh, lectures. I'll be giving three lectures, and just kind of uh, roughly uh, give you a. Uh, sort of a, a game plan uh, for, for, for at least my part of this week. Uh, to, today and tomorrow's uh, lecture, the, the former unit, okay? And so today I will be laying down some uh, uh, basic concept, uh, some reviews, right, and uh, uh, some recent uh, advances. And then uh, they'll be gearing up uh, to talk about a topic uh, that we recently uh, have been working on. And I think out of this audience, only Eli has uh, heard it. Okay, and uh, so I, I think it's a very, well, at least to us, it's very stimulating and, uh, and uh, f stimulating in terms of uh, making, a th not falling asleep, okay, so I <laughs> uh, would love to get feedback from, from you guys, okay. And uh, the, yeah, so, yeah, so today I will be talking to you about some of these things in E. coli, and uh, with, with the, uh, we're uh, having in mind that the, uh, then we'll be, uh, tomorrow we'll be looking at what happens to other species, okay? And, uh, and I won't tell you which changes which will be the same, right? So you have to be on alert. 
And uh, so then tomorrow afternoon, we'll have a group discussion. Uh, as Wolf already mentioned, I think that'll be fun. Just everybody will participate. I mean, we'll toss out a few slides to, to generate questions. And I think with, with a you know, group of uh, physicists here, just uh, discussion will just take over. And then uh, on Thursday, I'll talk about uh, some aspect of a uh, community dynamic, something we've been working on, something uh, we are thinking about and writing up, and uh, uh, to get your feedback. Okay. So, and um, as uh, Jacopo was saying, please uh, interrupt me uh, anytime. Uh, the because uh, I don't. Yeah, this is a physics center, right? I, mean, I don't feel right otherwise. Okay. <laughs> okay so, of course, I will start. Uh, with uh, Oli Moller, uh, the, uh, I guess, the founding father of this field of uh, microbial uh, physiology. Well, I would say maybe, maybe Monod's the, the real in, uh, intellectual founding fathers, but a lot of uh, what we directly work on came from uh, uh, Moller. Okay. Right, so uh, they uh, were looking at uh, uh, salmonella uh, in the late uh, 50s, but here the data is for E. coli. And if you grow uh, E. coli in a, a bunch of a medium, so LB will be uh, up here. Some of the like, acetate slow growing medium will be down here. And uh, so you get this uh, culture into exponential growth. And uh, you measure some of the very simple in total amount of RNA in the culture, total amount of protein in the culture. Take the ratio, you see that they form a uh, linear relation. Okay? And, uh, the, uh, so the x-axis is the steady state growth rate system. And I apologize that uh, for historical reason we've been calling it lambda. Yes, mu uh, is, is also good. We, at the time we had mu for something else. I think in the cell division field it's very important that it's a doubling per, uh, per hour, right? uh, it's the doubling rate and, and uh, this is specific growth rate. Um, okay, so, this, uh, so as you change nutrient quality we'll have this linear relation. And uh, the RNA protein ratio stands, uh, is a proxy for ribosome concentration. Okay. <clears throat> Ribosomes are the machinery that makes uh, uh, proteins. Okay. And uh, molar at the time uh, already, uh, uh, at molar, uh, Neihard and Magasani were the first people to actually show this type of a, a plot, but these data is already contained in, uh, in, in molar's uh, study. Right? So they already have a pretty good understanding of uh, where this came from. That is, uh, to say, if, uh, uh, if all of the protein in exponential uh, growth for E. coli, uh, most of the protein is stable, okay? Uh, the degradation is about maybe 5% or less. <clears throat> and uh, so uh, if, this, uh, if all the ribosomes are uh, engaging in protein synthesis, okay, then the rate of a protein accumulation should just be the uh, flux of a protein synthesis uh, by the ribosome, okay? And then you can write down some equation in steady state growth gross rate multiplied by the total protein mass of the cell uh, or of the culture, just per something, uh, uh, that's the rate of accumulation. And uh, the rate of synthesis is how fast the ribosome works multiplied by the number of ribosome per uh, same amount of quantity. Okay? And uh, now if you, uh, you write the number of ribosome as a mass of all of the ribosomes in your culture divided by the molecular weight of the ribosome. Here, actually, the, the uh, mass of the ribosomal protein, since we're just talking about proteins. Okay? Uh, then you have a relation like this. If you equate the two together, I have a yeah. Okay, so then we see the fraction of ribosomal proteins out of all to, uh, proteins uh, in the system. We we'll call it a phi ribosome. Right? It's just growth rate divided by elongation rate in the unit of a massive ribosome. So this was a way of rationalizing this linear relation. Okay, and uh, the, when, when we were confronted with uh, this line of thinking, so that's great, but first let's check whether the numbers make sense. Right? And so according to uh, this description, the slope or inverse slope of this should be proportional to elongation rate. This is the case. And then with Matt Scott, we uh, did such a study. We look at the rib uh, ribosomes for mut mutants uh, of E. coli that, have, uh, that are translated at different rates. This is a wild type. Uh, these are mutants. Okay, these mutants have slower translation rate and the slope uh, uh, increases. Uh, increases. 
okay? And you can actually compare the inverse of slope to the elongation rate others have measured in vitro, and you see that it's a linear relation, okay? So then this is an experimental way to make this check, okay? So this seems uh, quite reasonable. And, uh, okay, but then the question is, uh, before I go on, I'll go on uh, along this line, but I'll say, so why should we care, right? So, uh, uh, for, 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 for ecological studies. So, I would uh, uh, like to give uh, uh, two examples, right? One is the, uh, okay, so not, not uh, ribosome is not the only thing that uh, have a simple relation with the growth rate. Right? And another is a catabolic system. So, for example, if you feed E. coli with the lactose, then expresses lag degradation enzyme, lag Z, and so forth, right? And um, uh, the, so you can do experiments in st throughout steady state growth. So you can reduce the uptake of the cell, uh, 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 reduce the lactose uptake rate, okay? So then it becomes carbon poor, and then it increases the expression of the lag system, okay? In this very simple linear way. And uh, one can go into analysis of where this came from. Basically, there's a you see there's a symmetry between this and this, okay? And this event going, the arrow going this way is called catabolite repression. It's a phenomenon known for 100 years, okay? It's not just uh, E. coli, but many microorganisms. If you give it better and a better carbon source, then it, uh, it, it reduces more and more the expression of a catabolic enzyme that's, that's used to bring in carbon source, okay? And... Uh, <coughs> So, uh, uh, yeah, so this is an example of going the opposite way, but it's the same statement uh, running in reverse. Okay, so, so why should ecologists care about this? Well, this is internally related. Uh, oh, oh so, so, the, uh, so the two parameters that, that determine this line. One is uh, if you extrapolate to zero growth, how much uh, of this uh, enzyme is expressed. So this is kind of the basal expression rate uh, in absence of a regulation. This is, this is produced by a, a regulation, right? And then there's another number, uh, we call the lambda C, that is uh, basically it's reflecting if, the full, if your uh, carbon uptake is not a problem at all, right? You have an infinite carbon coming in, how fast can the cell grow? Okay, because it's not only carbon, it still needs to take in nitrogen and do lots of other things, okay? So that's the, uh, that's the two numbers. So uh, what does it have to do with anything? Well. It has to do with the Monogross law that we uh, talked about, right? So this was a uh, Monogross uh, thesis, a, a, a page from Monogross thesis, uh, done in Paris in 1942. You know what was happening in Paris in 1942? Yes, uh, Monogross was a resistance leader, and uh, he was also doing uh, research. Um, <clears throat> right. So this is uh, for lactose. So you vary the lactose concentration, the medium. Right, and they measure the growth rate. And there's something, a uh, very simplistic behavior that emerges, okay? So how should we understand this? Well, from a microscopic point of view, you say the growth rate, uh, so cells are, so rho is the density of cells, right? So then the uh, increase of the number of cells in the, in the culture is uh, given by the uptake of lactose, the lactose converted to uh, biomass, uh, Y is the yield. And uh, then, <coughs> the, so this, you can expand it, and uh, say, uh, if it, uh, the enzyme that takes up lactose uh, has a, uh, uh, can be described by uh, uh, michaelis benton kinetics, right? So then this is, will be the uh, lactose uh, dependence. And then you multiply by the enzyme that, uh, concentration that's expressed, multiply by the, by the cell density, then you get the uptake of the entire cell, right? So that's the uh, first layer. Uh, view of the system. So often, uh, one stops here and says, ah, that's where uh, mono uh, kinetics uh, uh, come from. Mo but that's not the case, right, because of this here. Okay. This, uh, uh, mono kinetics, this is, a, this is a describing a steady state, uh, exponentially growing cells, okay, the adaptive cells. And adaptive cells, the enzyme concentration change. Okay. So, in fact, you should be uh, lo looking, you, sh you should be inserting this enzyme concentration by this growth rate dependent of phi. Okay. And uh, so when you do that, you get something, or well, well, whatever you get, right? So it's, it's, uh, uh, it's a more complicated system, uh, but, uh, it, but then it turns out that then if you simplify it, you still get an uh, a inverse relation uh, between inverse lambda and inverse lambda. So this is still effectively a Achilles relation. Okay? 
And um, of course, then this you re rewrite it, you get into this form with the effective parameters. Okay, that depends on uh, two, two things. This combination is a property of the enzyme. Right? And then this lambda C is a property of the cell. Okay, so even in the monokinetics, right, you have a meeting of the property of the entire cell. So the cell is there, the property of the cell uh, is there. Okay? And uh, uh, so you may ask, well, how do these numbers compare to each other right, for, for the lag system? Anybody know? So the answer is written, uh, it's already in this formula. Okay, so the, uh, uh, the lambda zero here is the saturated uh, growth rate in the saturated limit, like infinite uh, batch culture growth rate. Okay, lambda c is this uh, best the speed limit of, uh, of uh, growth uh, for different carbon sources. Okay, so then uh, to see the magnitude of this, you just need to compare the lambda zero to lambda c. Right, so lambda c is here. It's it, no 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 single substrate can reach that number. Okay, it's a speed limit. Right? So just ask yourself, where, what's the growth rate of E. coli on lactose? Right? If it is here, so lactose, this is actually lactose. Okay? Then you see it is very close to lambda C. That means it's saturated by uh, properties of the cell. It's limited by properties of the cell. Okay? If you change to a different carbon source, say mannose, it is up here. Then it's limited by the enzyme. Okay? So, yes? Uh, this is a concentration, sorry, this isn't some arbitrary uh, unit. It, could, it need to be converted to concentration, sorry. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I, just, took, I just took it out of a, uh, yes. Is you, you can convert this to uh, concentration or, or the per total protein, how much it is, then, 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 uh, then the, this number would match, yeah. <clears throat> okay? Right, so, 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 yeah, so this is a yeah, very simple lesson, right, to, to, to see that, uh, uh, yeah, in monokinetics, it contains the property of the cell, right? And then you can ask, well, what happens when nitrogen source change, for example? Well, when, when you change the nitrogen source, then this lambda C is changed. So depending on where you are, okay, then you get different uh, results. Okay. Um, okay, so then... Yeah, so this, this uh, lactose growth rate is here. So for lactose, it's, uh, it's uh, limited by other. So yeah, if you reduce the natural sources, lambda C will uh, uh, shift down, okay? And then everything will shift. <coughs> okay, so uh, that was for minimal uh, median with a simple common source. Then we can also look at what happens in rich median where uh, there's often a situation when the, the bacteria often in famine or feast and uh, during feast, all kinds of goodies are there, right? And uh, so this is an uh, example where for E. coli, we feed it with glucose, that's a gray bar, and you can add various goodies. So CAA is just a suite of amino acid, a hydrolyzed product of uh, a cassie. And then uh, the RDM is a rich defined medium where you also provide nucleotide, vitamins, and such, okay? And uh, uh, the growth rate keep on increasing, right? Then you see this uh, linear relation. So this is now uh, ribosome content in measured in amount of ribosomal proteins per total protein. So that was the phi RB I was uh, sp uh, speaking of, right? So it keep on increasing. Okay. So this is a, a glucose minimal medium, one of the fastest uh, uh, carbon source uh, uh, for in minimal medium. And then you uh, give it a supplement that keep on increasing. Okay, and this is uh, in absolute units, 25% and up to 40%. This is not just, sorry, this is not just the ribosome, but includes uh, elongation factors and other stuff that that's uh, used to escort the ribosome. Um, okay, so you see that uh, the, between glucose minimal median and uh, rich defined median plus glucose, uh, one of the, uh, the, the best uh, defined uh, rich median, there's a 15% increase in the protein allocated to ribosome. And that, that's just basically, the, you know, given how fast ribosome is going, to grow that much faster, you just need to have more ribosome, okay? And um, uh, where does 15% come from? And shown here are some of the other uh, 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 protein groups. So in, in this paper, we have a list of uh, a dozen or so. And most of this 15% uh, just come from 
reduction in amino acid biosynthesis. Okay, so when cell is growing uh, in uh, the presence of amino acid, it basically suppresses all of the <coughs> all, uh, synthesis of amino acid. Okay, and that's about 15%. Right now, so there's a consequence to this, and the consequence is that uh, the you know, if you're going happily in a rich medium, then suddenly uh, amino acids are gone, right? And then you, you have to grow in minimal medium, and then you have to make an order amino acid, okay? And uh, so if you make a, a shift experiment, and you first grow in amino acid plus this carbon source, and the take away the amino acid, only leave with the carbon source. So carbon source hasn't changed at all, okay? Just amino acid is gone. Then it, it has a two-hour lag. It doesn't matter what kind of a carbon source you give it. <clears throat> right, so these, uh, these various kind of ingredients could play a role. This is not what we normally call dioxide shift, but it's a, it's a, similar, it's a similar idea. Okay. All right. Uh, okay, so any uh, questions? Feel free to ask a question. Yes, Dan. Ah, you up and down? Uh, yeah, so this is, uh, so, uh, so as I said, so these two, uh, these two are without the carbon supplements, and the faster two growth rates are with the carbon supplements, okay? And, and, then, and then you see like nucleotide synthesis, you see the up and down because uh, uh, it's only this guy and this guy have the uh, nucleotide supplement. So with nucleotide, of course, it's, it's uh, suppressed. Yeah. So it's more complicated. It's, uh, when you dial growth rate, you cannot just dial when it comes to rich medium. It depends on what you give it. <clears throat> All right. So let me come back to uh, this uh, simple, simple linear relation. We'll be uh, dwelling on it for, for a while. Right. So this is the now, actually, just take the ribosomal protein, add up all the ribosomal proteins, and divide by the total protein. So the percent of the protein, that's the ribosomal protein, right? And that can be converted to number of ribosomes. And that was the same data uh, I showed you. We call this the R line, right? And uh, so, which is, uh, phenomenologically, we could just write down a relation like this, right? uh, growth rate, phi up is the y-axis, there's a, a slope, we call the inverse of the slope, is something that's more interpretable, called uh, uh, gamma naught, and then there's an the offset. Phi R B now. Two parameters. Okay. Uh, how should they be related uh, to, uh, molecularly uh, to what we know? All right. So we already said uh, that the. Uh, okay, this is. A, okay. Right. So I already mentioned if we assume efficient translation, every ribosome is engaged in translation, then we get uh, this uh, relation. Okay, where uh, uh, this epsilon here is the elongation rate in units of a uh, massive ribosome. And uh, further showed you that we directly tested and we find that inverse slope is proportional to the elongation rate, right? So, is this enough to say that this inverse slope is this quantity? Right? So now we're talking about with equality. Right? <laughs> and, uh, uh, well, actually, not quite, okay? And uh, the reason is that if you measure uh, the translation rate, you actually see a two-fold change between the slowest growth rate and the fastest growth rate, okay? So, uh, 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 the, okay, so that was uh, something that was first, uh, Done by Hans Bremer in 1976. So Moller has all of this um, idea explanation in terms of uh, what, what we're saying here, right? That that uh, the sorry, um, I, my my uh, my thing is now uh, <laughs> working. So so we have this. Um, uh, so Moller Moller was uh, thinking along this line. So there's a ribosome that translating certain uh, rate, right? And uh, uh, so things are allocating a resource in this way. Then uh, Hans Bremer produced this data. He actually measured the elongation rate, okay? And uh, so he did the three, four points, and it's clear that already it's not constant, okay? And that basically completely killed uh, this idea, okay? And uh, that was done in 1976. Uh, Moller died in 1979. I don't think he ever forgive 
uh, answer for, for that. Okay. Well, it's nothing to forgive him, it's just the way it is. Okay. And I was told he was, he was not happy you know, the last several years of his life. Okay, so, so the, yeah, so something like, uh, sounds very good, right, but kind of, uh, it's where you actually do the measurement, it's just, it's not there. And have a factor of two change. Right, so then, uh, you, I certainly cannot put a equality here, I mean, we, we, which elongation are we talking about? <clears throat> I don't know why. Okay, so then the next thing I'm going to try is, uh, so we try this uh, a little uh, later, that is uh, um, uh, the, we said, okay, so let's say, okay, so fine, elongation rate is not a constant, but it's a function of a growth rate, right? But let's suppose it's a function of growth rate, then let's just put these two equations together and see what we get, right? And when you do that, you get uh, another, uh, Michaelis uh, relation. Okay, you get the Michaelis relation between elongation rate and the, the growth rate. And uh, then the, so the, from this, it's tempting to say that, okay, this is obviously have to do with, with the, no, this is saturation when growth rate is the infinity, uh, whatever the saturate tool, we call this the E max, right? And then this is suggests that we should interpret gamma, this uh, inverse slope as the maximum elongation. And if you plug in the numbers, uh, they even uh, look quite good. Okay, so we, we, we know what this number is, we know this slope, and they correspond to each other. I'll show you uh, in, in a minute. Okay, uh, so it works well for fast growth, but clearly for slow growth, it's just completely wrong. It's nonsense, right? Because at slow growth, well, a growth rate approaches zero, right? We, we know that the elongation rate approaches about half of the maximum elongation rate. Okay, so it's still elongating quite a bit. You, you can measure it. Um, <clears throat> but ribosome, well, ribosome also goes to a finite amount, right? So there's no way, uh, you know, this is going to zero. There's no way this equation can hold, right? So something's wrong. No, no, this is just data. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so there's, there's, uh, there's, 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 yeah, so there's some, yes, so there's some slope, but the, the point here is that at, at zero growth, it is finite, right? There's just no, 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 no way to get around it. You have lots of rivals from sitting there, and you can measure how fast they're elongating, okay? And there's no way it's producing zero, zero growth rate, okay? And uh, <clears throat> so, so, of course, then uh, when, important ingredients is uh, some or most of these ribosomes are inactive, right? So there are lots of molecular studies on what, what factors uh, uh, cells express as slow growth uh, to inhibit, uh, to, to make, to hold ribosome inactive, okay? So, um, <clears throat> but we have no idea how to set the level of inactive ribosomes. I mean, we can we'll look into regulation, but find a binding constant, this and that, and, and then just, this is not getting closer to explaining, right? So what we have is a missing parameter here, uh, offset. But to explain that, we have to bring in lots of molecular details, so this is not a productive approach. Okay. But it does uh, show that this uh, simple offset here, there's important biology, right? And the cell, cell cares about it. And to, to, to a mathematician looking at this, I just see some number, but it's a number that cell cares about. In a sense, that special mechanism develop uh, uh, to, to put it. Yes, Tom? Yes. Yeah. So, 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 we're let's say at zero plus. Uh, no, we're let's say twenty-four hour doubling. Okay. You, it, it, simple to put in some medians growing very slowly. Okay. And uh, yeah. So you know how fast it'll be uh, uh, protein synthesis on the whole is, right? And there's nothing compared to the amount of ribosome multiplied by elongation, right? So. Certainly, now there could be many things going on, including protein degradation and such, okay? But then one important aspect is uh, uh, inactive ribosomes. <coughs> All right. <coughs> okay, so the, um, 
So we didn't know what to do, okay? And uh, so I'm gonna come back uh, to this in uh, five, 10 minutes. Wait, um, well, how much time do I have? Am I already done? I have half an hour, uh, okay, okay. Huh? Yeah, 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 okay, yeah. Okay, so then I'm gonna switch the gear, I'll quickly leave you with this, this question, okay, but then the answer to this sort of uh, came about accidentally in a different study, which is also related. So I'm gonna tell you this uh, a different study and, we, we, and then come back to this, okay? And uh, uh, the different study was motivated by many tough questions we had, like already with the, the, the paper with uh, Matt Scott uh, 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 reporting the, uh, these, these uh, gross dependencies. Uh, and effect on the cell. And so we had a, uh, so I guess, you know, anytime time you put out something, you, you, you get criticism from all kinds of people. But our strongest criticism of being actually being from physicists, or well, maybe biologists don't, don't say anything when they don't like it, okay, but physicists will actually tell you, right? And uh, uh, well, some, even some of my most respected uh, uh, physicists are doing biology, right? And the criticism is, what are you saying? The, because x-axis is a growth rate, right? I mean, growth rate is regulating this, growth rate is regulating that, right? So it makes no sense, okay, basically. And uh, <coughs> so, 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 so that's, uh, uh, so, we, so we presented that study as a phenomenological study. We don't know why, right? Just call it a bunch of correlations. But of course, the question is always in mind about Obviously, cells are organizing this re response in a quite reasonable way according to growth uh, rate. I mean, you can at least very mildly change the way you grow these cells uh, you know, with different carbon sources and so forth, it doesn't matter, right? So cells have a way uh, to know about growth rate, right? But how, does a, but how does a cell know how fast it grows? So this has to do with a perception uh, issue, right? So now we're talking about the cell, the bag of molecules, well, how does a bag of molecule know how fast it grows? And uh, okay, we can ask the same kind of question that these days we're studying community, we can ask the same for the community, right? Uh, the community is doing something. Well, how do members of the community know what the whole is doing? Okay, and until, and so on, on Thursday, just a minute, I'm gonna present something that gonna assume that the community knows what, what, what the community, the state of the community is, right? And I uh, can imagine immediately people have the same kind of a, objection for, well, <laughs> how, how to know. The people, I mean, even though we're physicists here, I mean, we've been entrained by biologists to, to challenge this, uh, these uh, things about mechanism, right? Until we have a mechanism, but, uh, uh, well, how, should, well, how should we believe in it? Okay. So, uh, in this case, uh, yeah, so Marco now. Yeah. So you, 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 could, you, could, you could say, right, that the uh, cell senses the uh, temperature, certainly can sense, right? Uh, it can sense the concentration of uh, lactose, well, probably not, because, it, I mean, uh, only, only uh, outside can you sense the uh, concentration of lactose. But we've done an experiment, we play with the lactose uptake, so lactose concentration is actually high, right? We just limited the uptake of lactose. It does behave exactly in the way as if it's a reduced growth. Right. So cells are probably smarter than just kind of a, making a, a kind of a fixed mapping of whatever the environment is to the other. And you can also imagine I can give a combination of nutrients that has no chance of seeing before. And it will still work in the problem. So it has a smarter way to figure out how fast it works. Right. So that's a... Lots of uh, nutrients that you are incorporating. Let's say, like for example, charged RNAs. I don't right. Know, so you, you, you can you can you can think about you can think about very you can think about uh, a flux of this, but then but then the, but then immediately the issue is let's say if I have a multiple flux coming, which one should you, should you pay attention to? Right. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. So the so if you ask uh, this question uh, to uh, the biologists, immediately they tell you about this uh, special molecule PPGPP. Ah, this is involved. It's known, right? It's involved uh, in growth rate, mediating growth rate dependent uh, response. 
And what does PPGPP do? Well, it, then they will tell you. I don't know why my control is not working, right? So it listens to tRNA charging, right? So here is a reminder of a translation process where tRNA charges tRNA. So the system that charges uh, 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 tRNA and the charged tRNA is fed into the ribosome, okay? And so PPGPP is uh, kind of a, a survey some uh, step in, uh, in here to see how the translation process is going. But then you have the similar kind of a question. I have a 20 amino acids. Which one should, should you pay attention to? So it's never mind about PPGP, how would you design the system, right? You have many, many things that's coming in. You know, you have a, uh, Italy, right? I mean, the economy of Italy, what should we monitor to see the state of uh, uh, growth in the economy, right? So it's a real economical <laughs> uh, question. Uh, how, how to monitor. And clearly, if you know something about uh, how fast it should be growing, right, you are growing, uh, it's a good thing. So you can, you can plan things accordingly. <clears throat> so, uh, so we did this uh, study, and then the, the upshot of the study is that actually uh, PBGPP senses the elongation speed of the ribosome. Okay? Uh, but I'll just uh, briefly walk you through this uh, to see what's the strategy uh, you know, so, so, so we have some piece of data, and with data with some imagi imagination, and then there's a picture that give you, suggests how the cell might be uh, uh, sensing it, okay? So here's an experiment. Uh, do a, this is a typical diapsy shift. Uh, you're growing glucose, and the glucose ran out, and it switches to glycerol, and during uh, this uh, 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 shift, there's a lag because the cell has to make proteins uh, to, to uh, take up uh, glycerol, okay? And during this lag, there's a period where obviously growth rate is changing, and then we can do measurements. Okay. <clears throat> and uh, uh, so we measured the elongation uh, speed at various points during the lab, and this is a very laborious uh, study. Right? At, the, at every point, it takes samples and do elongation uh, speed measurement. And there's a dip, a slow, growth slows down, and it slows down, and then uh, gradually recover by the time uh, uh, an hour. Okay, we also measure the PPGPP level, okay, and it has the exact opposite behavior. <clears throat> and if you make a scatter plot of the two, you see a linear relation between the PPGPP level and the inverse of the elongation rate. <clears throat> All right, and uh, so we call the, uh, so this, 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 this nice extrapolation down to sort of a zero PPGPP, which would be like the fastest elongation rate possible, and we, uh, called this the inverse of a maximum elongation rate. So this is fine for the maximum elongation rate, okay? And so this study was done uh, in transient, but we also did it in steady state, okay? So steady exposure changing the carbon source and so forth. And uh, then these are the color symbols, okay? And uh, th this data, this line here is, is the blue symbol, and they lay on top of each other. So both for transient and for steady state, it's the same relation between PPGP level and uh, the inverse of the elongation rate. So then, this data, then with this data, then we attempted to write down uh, such a relation. Yeah. No, it's not. Yeah, so what we directly measure is the time it takes to produce certain protein, okay? Uh, and no, uh, right. usually that's a, that's kind of the, uh, what, what, so, so it, the process could be faster because the, 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 if you measure, let's say, it, you wait, okay, you, you, you uh, so during the transition, you induce a gene expression and you say that takes uh, two minutes to, to make this protein, in this case, lag Z, okay? So if you assume it starts from the beginning and makes two minutes, well, that gives you elongation speed. But in, in reality, there could be a you know, dead startup time and so forth, so it'll be a, a bit faster. But we tried to, uh, to the best of our ability to take into account of these uh, startup time. Okay? Uh, but still, we could be missing something. <clears throat> yes. Okay. So this is the, uh, this is the uh, uh, assumption. Uh, the... Okay, 
uh, the so okay so then the so now so so this is all all, all we're gonna this is a base the experimental basis of taking an inverse relation between the PPGPP level and the inverse elongation rate. Okay, now we uh, put into some bio, put in some biological facts that the PPGPP is known to repress the synthesis of ribosome. Okay. And so then you, so there's some data here. This is the RNA protein ratio, the proxy for ribosomal protein. We're going to also directly measure ribosomal protein. Uh, is a linear function of the inverse of uh, PBGP. Okay. <coughs> so then we, well then we, we write down uh, something like this. It is also known that uh, PBGPP, when PBGP level is high, uh, the uh, various ribosome remodeling factors are synthesized, and the effect is to titrate away ribosomes. And we, we were able to, we have proteomic data on a number of these, okay, they are increased with a, 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 a ribosome a PBGPP level, right? And uh, we just write here, uh, sum together so it's something that's proportional to G. Okay, this is certainly not, uh, I mean, you can argue about there's a uh, intercept or something. We put an intercept result does not change that much. Okay, so we just go with this. Yeah. Huh? Uh, relative, oh, uh, what does uh, relative PPGPP concentration mean relative to what? Okay, so it's just, a, so we measure PPGPP by a radioactivity. Okay, so it's just a count of a radioactivity. That's the unit it's, it's measured. So it doesn't mean anything. So we operationally we reference this to say steady state uh, glucose condition, okay? But 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 uh, theoretically a better measure would be what what it would be in the infinite slow growth condition. But it's just some unit, okay? Yeah. It's not important for this. <coughs> All right. So then with these two we can combine them, right? So the active ribosome is a uh, the difference between these two. And uh, okay, so then we say, well, okay, then growth rate is the just the elongation rate in units of ribosome multiplied by the active ribosome. Now we have uh, the okay, and this is uh, just basically a combination of these two terms. So so this active ribosome is a function of G, but then this E is a function of G also if we invert it. Okay, and this inversion we can uh, always we can only do uh, in steady state growth. Right, so this this theory only applies to steady state. Yeah. So uh, PPGPP is a transcriptional activator. Sorry, of these uh, uh, ribosome yeah. sequestering yeah. Yeah. genes. Molecular, that's well known. Yeah. And that's well known, or is yeah. okay. Not the not this. Uh, uh, not uh, the relationships, but the transcriptional so regulation. But, is, uh, yeah, yeah. But okay. the PPP through the SKA and so forth. How 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 it the in the selection so Yeah. Unless it's too deep of a rabbit hole, does how do they, those ribosome sequestering genes work? Do they just uh, start being translated and uh, get stuck somehow, or what? What is the mechanism? What do you mean, I mean, the ribosome sequestering genes. What? What? How do they work? How well, do they, they sequester they, the ribosome? They go and uh, say block the site uh, where, where where ribosome will be taking in you know, mRNA and so forth. That's that's one way. Okay. Another way is they actually take two ribosomes together, bind them together. Okay, so there's very dedicated mechanism, very important. If you get rid of them, cells in trouble. Okay, mainly in, in stationary phase. Okay, yeah, but yeah. Uh, in, uh, in your experiment, um, uh, then there is a transcriptional time scale for the activation of these uh, ribosome sequestration uh, proteins. Yes, yes. Yes. And then yes. that would, uh, but, uh, but that would we, actually we have look at the minutes. I mean, the, the, these things, they're very small. They're very quick. Okay. They're very small protein. And, and it's just like, just tons of, that's all they make. I mean, they're, they're one of the most uh, highly expressed uh, stuff. Yeah. Uh, so you say that this theory just applied on steady state, but which part does not apply during shift? Uh, okay, so the steady state is, is a simple way to, to, for me to think about, okay? So like, you know, this, this is a relation uh, we, we get, right? We know we're varying elongation speed because we're changing nutrient, okay? Uh, but then inverting this, I mean, I don't even know what that means, right? 
So in steady state, I can do this, because I, I know just one-to-one -one relation. So mechanistically, I mean, so we'll, we'll talk about dynamics later, but maybe, maybe not. Uh, but yeah, but we do, do, we do have a, a piece of work, several pieces of work on, on the dynamics. So you, you can use this relation and, and do the dynamics. <coughs> yeah, but steady state is easy to input. All right, so, so you see, okay, now you see uh, the elongation rate is related to uh, PBGDP, and uh, the active translating ribosome related to PBG, PB, PBGDP, product of the two gives the growth rate, right? So that defines a unique relation between PBGPP and the growth rate. Okay, so that's, we believe that the strategy, uh, in, in principle, details you know, may, may be more complicated, but if I have a, so growth rate is a product of the active ribosome and how fast they work. If I've got my hands on both of these quantities, well, then I have a mapping between PPGP and the growth rate, right? So now, then I can use PPGP to regulate a whole bunch of other things, and the output is to have a growth rate dependent regulation. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so in steady steady is a constant. Right, but uh, but but uh, but the, because of this uh, because of this relation, well, we have to see that what changes at different growth rate, how things change in the connect, in, until kinetics. So that's a part I don't think I'll ever get to uh, in, in this. But I will can talk in private. Okay, I'll talk about that. That that I'll talk about. Right, but you already see that it's for for this to work. Elongation rate has to change, right? So Moller's picture was constant elongation. If it's constant elongation rate, you simply cannot e exploit that information, and that would not be a productive end. <clears throat> All right. So let me now discuss the prediction of this. Okay. So, uh, but but uh, we'll first point out, I have three parameters here. All right. So I need to say something about. Ultimately, I would like to see the ribosome uh, protein ratio. This R line, uh, the R line should uh, come out of this, right? Uh, but then I have a number of uh, uh, parameters, okay? But this can be uh, uh, so easy to fix these parameters. Uh, so first of all, growth rate go to zero. And for simplicity, I, let me just set the unit of G to be one in the limit of growth rate go to zero. It could be anything, it doesn't matter, okay? Just, uh, just uh, call it something, one, okay? Uh, the, so with growth rate go to zero, obviously the active ribosome fraction needs to go to zero because uh, you know, we know the elongation rate is now zero, right? So that means uh, so active ribosome goes to zero, so that means A, G, A over G equal to B times G, right? And, uh, and well, I also know that ribosome fraction goes to this offset. Okay, so that already takes care of two constants, A and B. <coughs> and uh, yeah, so, so we have this uh, relation. And uh, the, the, so now I can express G in terms of uh, ribosome, okay? The, because uh, I'm working towards getting expressing growth rate in terms of ribosome content only, right? But then I also, I still have this uh, elongation factor, but when growth rate goes to zero, elongation factor goes to a constant. Okay, so that constant is going to set this uh, number C, right? <coughs> and, um, uh, but then, so I need to say something about the constant, and uh, here I say, well, I know empirically it's a half of the maximum growth rate. Okay? Then that fixes everything. So now, elongation rate is also a simple uh, function of a G, okay? And then you substitute in uh, what the G is in terms of a ribosome. You have this expression, which is a uh, Michaelis dependent. Okay, so elongation rate has Michaelis dependent on the ribosome fraction. And that was actually uh, observed empirically a couple of years before uh, this work, okay? So then uh, we didn't know what, where that came from, but then, so here, it just naturally uh, emerges. <coughs> And the, uh, by the way, the, the, in this Michaelis relation, the Michaelis constant is just this offset uh, phi RB0 because, right, so we needed the when elongation rate uh, at this, uh, when growth rate goes to zero, this two equals, so elongation rate is one half. So there's no additional uh, parameters. <coughs> okay, so now I have everything. Uh, growth rate is, is a product of these things, and I know how each of these depends on uh, uh, G, and the, 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 then the G can be inverted to ribosome fraction. And if you work out the arithmetic, you get back 
uh, this linear relation with the slope, inverse slope now being this, uh, uh, what uh, Moller was proposing from the very beginning, but with the maximum elongation. Okay. <coughs> and uh, moreover, you can look at the elongation rate as a function of a growth rate, the growth dependent elongation rate, because you, you just plug this relation into the Michaelis relation. Okay. And uh, so it has a hyperbolic relation dropping to one half uh, right, when growth rate goes to zero. And uh, this is the uh, this uh, data. Okay, so so then so to check so this is the output uh, 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 of uh, uh, this uh, picture, right? And so we can check it this way. So we first have a ribosome, the ribosome, the R line. From the R line, we have a two fitting parameter we can extract. These fitting parameters, okay, and then then with this interpretation can be used to calculate a maximum elongation rate. And now this is completely, this formula is completely fixed. And the black line is a, just a, just a drawing of this uh, formula without any fitting parameter. Okay, so it, it matches. Or you can fit uh, to this line and go back and look at the slope and it's constant. I have some questions. Yeah. <clears throat> so I, I have two questions. Yeah. Um, one is about the factor of two, yes. which is kind of magic. Yeah. And, uh, and the other one is, uh, is what I said before, like in this, Dietal study, yes. um, um, you, you showed a deviation from this yes. linearity, yes. but that, no, yes. now we have to think that it's, yes. it's, a, no, no, it's so, a straight so, line. So, so, I, I, so if it's a factor two, you know, in general, this is a nonlinear relation because you, know, you, you have all kinds of uh, nonlinear dependence. If, if this is a factor two, is exactly linear. a factor two, then you get exactly a linear relation. Okay. okay. And this, this, this is a fit. Just dialog has many more data points. So this is a fit, assuming it's a, a, a fit to a linear so, form. So here yeah, we are not a, seeing the same data as in diatol. Or what? We are not seeing this logo. No, no. The, 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 so diatol, there was no not proteomic data. Uh, no, the, yeah, it, it was, uh, I would say, a, our first generation proteomic data, which is, uh, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. So we shouldn't trust the that data. So we, at that point, we just sort of were interested in form. We, were, we, were, we did not think our data was good enough for quantitative. I mean, look at the okay. and things like so that. we should look at the last generation data. The last Just generation data. The last generation yeah, data. We calibrated tell us that with ribose. No, because that this, you, to do this, this kind of thing, you really need to have a good handle on the absolute concentration. Yeah. So we should think that this is really a straight line in the data. So diadol was the RNA protein. <laughs> yes. Uh, so RNA, so RNA protein. Oh, so what you what you're saying is fraction, there's still a conversion. So RNA yeah. protein and um, and um, yeah, ribosome protein fraction. Yeah, because it includes RNA as well, right? So slow growth are not exactly the same. Okay, so um, yes, the uh, okay, so, right? So 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 we have really a quantitative congruence you know, down to the, uh, the shifts and the slope and all that. Okay, and and uh, yes, yeah, so then I, all of this I was saying hinges on this factor two being exactly factor two. It's a very interesting question. I'll return to uh, later. Okay. Um, Okay, so uh, one more thing I want to mention is that here's another way to express uh, the growth rate. So it's, uh, w one way is this way, but I can write this factor as a total amount of ribosome multiplied by the fraction of active ribosome, right? There's another way to write it. So it's useful to know what the fraction of active ribosome is, okay? So since I told you what this, uh, uh, this all depends on, the inactive ribosome fraction depends on G and therefore depends on ribosome fraction. And then you can see it's a, it has a, this uh, ratio, one minus offset divided by the amount of ribosome, square. Okay, and then the square makes things, make life uh, quite easy, right? Because roughly, you know, suppose I'm already, say, three times away from an offset, then I'm only making 10% error if I forget about inactive ribosome. Okay, so this expression that Moller had Moller and the Nihon and so forth had from the very beginning. Actually, it's really quite uh, good uh, as long as we are, let's say, uh, for anything in the rich median, it's well, well above threefold. And, and it's pretty good. Okay. But just that elongation rate is not constant. Right. So all of this is basically a footnote to the thing is, uh, basically, Moller's picture is uh, correct, okay, but there's some detail that make it correct even when elongation rate is a uh, gross rate dependent. So that's a, I think, for me, it's a lesson between phonological study and uh, 
microscopic study. This is something in physics we learn this over and over again, but we forget every time we get to it, right? Phenomenological study uh, is phenomenological study, and if you want to pin down to mechanism until you know everything, I mean, you can easily point to a piece of mechanism, oh, something is now working, right? And it doesn't mean the phenomenology is wrong. <coughs> okay. And, uh, right, so inactive ribosome uh, is negligible in rich medium, and this will be important when we talk about the uh, things tomorrow, because we're serving many, uh, other species, and we cannot afford to do this kind of measurement uh, <coughs> in every case. And we can estimate the maximum elongation rate just using the elongation rate in rich medium. Okay? So, uh, as I said, tomorrow we'll be uh, talking about this in the context of other uh, bacteria. But maybe here I can already ask you guys, right? So we'll talk about a number of features, right? Which you think about which one you think will be preserved across bacteria, which one will be a species dependent? Any, any, any guess? I mean, what's important, right? The, the what? Yes, mass of ribosome, yeah, within 10% is about the, the same. Yes, okay, okay, that, okay, that doesn't count. <laughs> uh, yes, the factor two is very important. It keeps the factor two. Okay, what else? What about what about the values? I mean, I'm going to tell you it's going to be linear relation, right? And then the only two parameters: one is a slope, one is an offset, right? What do you think is more important? What bacteria uh, 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 care about the slope or the offset? Okay, so you so you think slope slope is not important. I, but slope has an interpretation of an elongation uh, speed of a uh, kinetics of ribosome, right, which is very important. Okay. What about the offset? Yeah, about the offset, actually, uh, the question is uh, uh, the very slow growth. Yeah. Uh, then maybe there are other biological processes like uh, uh, like uh, degrad like balancing degradation or whatever else. But what or, happens uh, like, at uh, a slow growth is another thing. But here the offset is defined as you, know, you measure with the reasonable growth rate down to you know point one, point two, and extrapolate it. So there's a right. So even for them, there's a meaning of what the offset is. That's right. Okay. Yeah. I don't why, why do you need to inactivate ribosomes at all? What is, it, uh, what is the evolutionary purpose of keeping ribosomes okay, suppose, inactive? Suppose at very slow growth, you dial yourself down to very low ribosome, right? Now suddenly, good nutrient come back. It you cannot be universal, you, you cannot, right? You cannot catch it because you have ribosome. But it, it, that, that immediately answers that this offset cannot be super universal because some bacteria are really bad hedging against bad times, others don't care. They are always growing in a super rich medium somehow. And it will be lifestyle dependent. Huh? It will, so the offset will be dependent on the lifestyle and the, the range of uh, growth rates they want to explore. Okay. Right, so keep this, keep this thing in mind. Okay, I'm not going to tell you, but, but uh, t tomorrow we'll see okay. what, 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 what's the same, what's different. Oh. <clears throat> and, and you learn something from, from what they keep the same. So, uh, uh, will you say something about how PPGPP senses the elongation rate? What mechanism might exist? Okay. Aren't you replacing I, um, the growth rate with the elongation rate? I wasn't going to talk about it, but the slides are there. I mean, the, am, am I out of time already? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I can. I can. I can get to. I can get to. Uh, I thought only. Molecular biologists will ask these questions, but uh, yeah. So, right. So this is the expression uh, we have. It is empirical. This is, this is a, just a, a phenomenological relation, right, between PBGBP and the elongation that I talked about. Okay. So then to interpret this, what, what does the right-hand side mean, the ratio of these uh, two, right? Uh, let's consider a step in the translation cycle. We have uh, 
uh, you know, the, the ribosome is sitting here looking at the, looking at the uh, triplet codon, waiting for TNA to come in, and it finds the right, uh, tripl the right uh, 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 charged TNA comes in, and then, uh, and then uh, it charges, right? And, and so this is a time dwelling time, right? So it's waiting for the right charge uh, to come. And then once the right, uh, right TNA comes, then it would, it would uh, you know, shift the peptide bond and then move forward. Okay, so we call this uh, the translocation time. Okay, so roughly, you know, think of these uh, two steps in the, in, the, in the translation process. Okay, every step takes these two steps. And, uh, right, so then the inverse of the elongation um, rate is just the total wait time. That's the sum of these two times. Okay? And the fastest possible, so the, the translocation time is obligatory. I mean, you always, okay? So if you have infinite nutrient, then the best you can do is set uh, the, the dwelling time to zero. Right? And that would be the inverse of the, of the uh, uh, maximum elongation rate. Okay? So then, uh, then this, uh, this, uh, this quantity in the parentheses is just a ratio of the dwelling time to translocation time. Okay? So if this, ex if this expression is correct, right, then, then one way to get it is by looking at the ratio of these two times. Okay? And at, uh, the, the, um, right? okay, so now I can think about uh, this process. You have a population of ribosome, the two population of ribosome, that's in the in, uh, waiting uh, for, for the TNA to hit and the one with the charged TNA, right? And so then uh, if you have a, a flux balance between these two, right, then you have, a, you have the product of these two rates uh, to, uh, to be the same. The, the amount multiplied by the, uh, the uh, rates going forward the dwelling time and the amount of uh, the other go by the inverse of the translate, uh, translocation time, right? <coughs> Okay, so then, uh, and the total, the total active ribosome is sum of these two populations, okay? So now, then you can write down expression for the charging time, and um, uh, then the, uh, the, ch the charge uh, portion, that's just the, um, the total uh, multiplied by the ratio of the two, uh, uh, the, two the, the translocation time divided by the total waiting time, okay? And then, well, Anyway, why, why am I saying all that to say? So you know, sum over all of the population. The first line is for uh, 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 TNA specific uh, 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 flux balance, and then if you sum over all of the pools, then you get a the relation between the total uh, pools of ribosome sitting there waiting for TNA and the ones that's uh, uh, that's uh, 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 ready to do the translocation. Okay. So then all that's saying is then this PBGVP level, this ratio can be written as a ratio of these two pools, okay? And uh, so how, that's, and then the question comes, so how, how can you design something to measure the ratio of these two pools? <coughs> okay, so you can see, we're gonna think about a model of PBGPP dynamics, there's a synthesis and there's a degradation, right? So that's, uh, this level would be uh, given by the ratio of a synthesis and the degradation. So the simplest scenario would be if you have a synthesis that's proportional to one pool and the degradation that's proportional to another pool. Okay? And um, so then, um, so now a couple to uh, what's known molecularly, it is known that the rail A, uh, the molecule, uh, one of the two molecules that synthesizes uh, PPGVP uh, from GTP, right? It actually does its job when it is a, uh, in the, when, when there's a tRNA in the ribosome and it's, it, it's a, a stuck in the ribosome, okay? So basically, so this is a, uh, the way we view it is that this is nature's mechanism of a, of a probing of this pool of a ribosome that's waiting. Because when you're waiting, you have like a, until you have the right thing to come in, you have an uncharged tRNA that come in, okay? So this thing only makes, does its job, make PPGPP, when you have uncharged tRNA in the ribosome Okay, uh, uh, yeah, and, and uh, it is uh, even, let's see, I, I may have a, yeah, so here's even a molecular picture. Okay, so here's the ribosome. You have the three tRNA. This is the uncharged, by design, this, this last uh, triplet, there's not a charging. Okay, so it's an uncharged tRNA that's trapped in it. And sitting behind this is the rel A. Okay, and uh, then this, is the business domain of the relay. That's where it, it, it does it produces the PPGP. Okay, 
So the molecule is designed so that the RELA molecule is hybridized with a, a tRNA, okay, and it gets dragged in. Okay, so if it's uncharged tRNA, okay, then the position is switched, and uh, the position is different, and it basically opens up the, in, only inside the ribosome does this structure gets opened up. Otherwise, this is a titrated. It, it's a sequestered by the protein. Okay, when it gets dragged right into the ribosome, it gets uh, uh, stretched out, and that is when it produces PPD. So it's a very delicate mechanism. Right? This is one, so th there's another uh, molecule that also makes PPGPP. Nobody knows about how it works. But here is this example of how things might work. Right. So <laughs> the hold on, a final thing is, uh, uh, yeah, so then there is, uh, so, uh, so this is about synthesis. And there's also a degradation that's done. There's only one uh, protein that in E. coli can do the job, spot T. Okay. Nobody knows how spot T works, but our hypothesis is that you know, some signal is so when the thing is ready to move forward, there's some signal that enables spot T uh, to do the job. So that way, uh, you can sense both the degradation and the synthesis. Uh, sense both, yeah, these two pools. Right? I'll take the, the ratio of the two. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I, I, I was going to talk about uh, the, the, the kinetics. So once we have the causal relationship right, of how nutrient change changes the elongation rate and changes PVGPP, then can, in principle, put the whole thing uh, into work to talk about kinetics of a, during growth transition, actually, what happens. Right? People uh, in the ecology community just use mono uh, form and just nutrient change, and it's a sort of a, that's, that's, but that's not a kinetics. Right, because mono, mono, the monokinetics is really not kinetics, it's a steady state relation between growth rate and the nutrient. Right? But if you want to talk about kinetics, you have to do this kind of a thing. Okay. I'm Thank you very much. Thank you.